All right, Great America, we're going to do some quick reviews of the Peninsula Campaign and then Fords, Donaldson, Henry, and Shiloh. After First Bull Run, President Lincoln fires General Urban McDowell and replaces him with this guy who should be the all-American hero known as George McClellan who should have high schools named after him, he should have been president. No man was set up more for greatness than George McClellan, and he blows it every single time. He will go in with 175,000 men, and he will lose 25,000 by the end. His opponent at first will be Joe Johnston, who is defending Richmond, and eventually Robert E. Lee. And after the civil, after the first battle of Bull Run, um, with it go the ends of a short, quick war. It's now going to take a long time, or so we think. But George McClellan has a plan. As Irvin McDowell is demoted, George McClellan is brought in. And here's this guy who graduates early from the University of Pennsylvania. He then goes to West Point, where he's selected most likely to succeed. And he fights very well um, when he graduates second in his class and fights in the Mexican War. Details of his bravery are solid. But when he goes to the Crimean War and he sees the death of the famous Light Brigade, something within him changes. When he returns, he quits his job with the Army and goes to work for the railroad. Some of the good things about George McClellan is he was smart and he was well organized. And one of the things that he does is he lays out a training schedule that will organize and build the commander of the Army of the Potomac. George McClellan has a lot of ills, but you can't say he didn't train and build the Army. Problem is, he spent a lot of his time sucking up to and smooching, smooching politicians, not Pauls, but I mean smooching politicians, while he disagreed with President Lincoln on nearly every political and military issue. McClellan hated President Lincoln and calls him the original um, gorilla. Uh, we're going to skip Stonewall Jackson here. And McClellan is going to influence more of the Civil War than probably anybody else. Most of the deaths in the Civil War can be laid directly at his feet. He will always, in the midst of a fight, when one more punch would deliver that knockout blow, he backs off, saying that I have to, to retreat so I can live to fight another day. No, man, if you drop him right now, all right, you guys... Can, can win, but he doesn't have that fortitude. He always was negative, right? The glass was more half empty than it was half full. And he decides, I'm not going to attack through Manassas the way Irvin McDowell did. I'm going to take my army around Joe Johnston. I'm going to sail from Washington down the Potomac, Potomac River. I will land just off of Norfolk, and I will swoop down the York James Peninsula, and I will hammer Richmond. I'll be there in two or three days. At 60 miles, this is not going to be a problem for me at all. And Joe Johnston is stuck. He's up in front of Washington looking at some of the army that Abraham Lincoln forced McClellan to leave behind, 35,000 troops. And he can't stay where he is, and he can't get back to defend Richmond. And here's where Lincoln, as you can see, McClellan are going to disagree. When Lincoln says, I want 35,000 men to defend me. This is what I need. And McClellan says, well, if I get to Richmond fast enough, they won't have time to um, destroy the capital. They'll be busy. He's like, look, man, McClellan, they're 20 miles from here. I need a defensive force you go down there and destroy Richmond. When you get there, I will release the other 35,000 men led by Irvin McDowell to help you out. So this Lincoln-McClellan fight is going to cause a big problem. 
Well, McClellan gets to the peninsula. He is supposed to make this lightning-like strike right down the peninsula in three days. Instead, it takes him weeks to get his men offloaded. When he gets there, when he gets there, he begins to see the specter of Robert E. Lee's Confederate ghost, two, three, maybe four hundred thousand soldiers. And after General Winfield um, Hancock goes crazy as he gets behind the Confederates in the town of Yorktown, but McClellan makes him retreat, McClellan gets intelligence from Alan Pinkerton saying that there is a vast army opposing him. Probably two, three hundred thousand soldiers. And Hancock's like, no, there's not. There's like eight, maybe fifteen. But under orders from Joe Johnston to slow down George McClellan, Confederate General John B. Magruder takes his men at the top of a hill and they sing the State of Virginia song, they fry the Virginia flag, and they march down the hill. And as they get down the hill next to this stream, they turn and they run back down around the back of the hill where McClellan can't see them. And they come back up, and this time, they're the state of Georgia, and then Alabama, and Tennessee. And they literally march in circles for eight hours, making McClellan believe that there's this huge army in front of him. There's got to be 150,000 men minimum. What exactly am I doing here? In reality, Joe Johnston at his height is going to have about 70,000 men. Professor Lowe is going to fly a hot air balloon over and take aerial photographs saying they don't have that many men. But McClellan won't listen. Hancock says, man, I can see 15,000 guys, that's it. Montgomery Meade says they don't have enough food. We've got to attack. And McClellan moves slowly but surely down the peninsula, blowing up every two and a half miles of terrain he can find. We won't know it until later, but McClellan has twice as many men on the peninsula as the Confederates have in the entire Confederate army. It takes him close to a month, and finally he is six miles from Richmond. He can read, see the clock tower downtown, instead of attacking, he stops. He refuses to invade Richmond until he was ready. He tells Lincoln, you send me those 35,000 guys and I'll attack. And Lincoln says, when you attack, I will send them. And the problem is there's no communication. McClellan extended his right arm above this little stream called the Chickahominy River, expecting Irvin McDowell to meet up with him. But the problem is McClellan never tells McDowell to come down. So a third of McClellan's army is across this little stream known as the Chickahominy River, where they could be cut off if the river flooded which it has a capacity to do. Confederate General Joe Johnston sees this, and he says, man, I can't take 150,000 guys, 175,000 guys, but I can take 35. And so he fights the Battle of Fair Oaks and Seven Pines, May 31st to June 1st, 1862. He is wounded in the first day's action, seeing the chaos Jefferson Davis will appoint his military advisor, Robert E. Lee, as the head commander of the Confederate States of America's Army of Northern Virginia. So now Lee is in charge, and the rest is history. So, Robert E. Lee will set about reorganizing the Army, the command structure. And he says, McClellan will figure this out sooner or later, so I've got to strike him hard, and I've got to strike him fast. And so Lee sent for Thomas Jackson, who was ravaging the Shenandoah Valley. His men moved like ghosts from the northern end to the southern end, destroying three different armies of Nathaniel Banks, former Speaker of the House, John the Pathfinder Fremont, and Irvin McDowell. The Union Army is scared. They're terrified. They're peeing their pants. And when you're off balance and not ready, you don't need to send an invitation more than once to Robert E. Lee. 
He's one of the most hard-fighting generals in American history. So in he goes. And Lee wants to be aggressive. He wants to, to make his army look bigger and nastier than it is. So he sends Jeb Stewart on a scouting patrol where he rides behind the entire Union army. It takes him four days. He calls out General McClellan and says, come and meet me. But McClellan never does. With all the information from Stewart, Lee orders an attack. So what's going to happen is we are going to fight seven, six battles in seven days. And each time the Union wins, they will retreat down the peninsula back to Harrison's Landing. Lee gambles the independence of his country on the fact that he is going to scare the crap out of McClellan. The man with every advantage possible, George McClellan, will sit and quake in his trenches. So the Union Army is being led by a guy named John Porter on the far side of the Chickahominy in this little fort he makes above Beaver Dam Creek near the town of Mechanicsville. Lee wants to send in an attack with Stonewall Jackson, but Jackson uncharacteristically is late. So A.P. Hill, Ambrose Powell Hill, advanced placement, begins a frontal assault. And it's disastrous as Porter's cannons blow him to smithereens. Lee is angry because people aren't listening to his plan. D.A. Hill, Thomas Jackson's brother-in-law, tries to help out. And his men try, and they attack until 9 o'clock, and they're blown to smithereens. Porter and his men haven't moved. It is a definite Union victory. But a captured Union soldier lets slip that Jackson is on the way. When McClellan hears this, he panics. McClellan orders his supply lines abandoned, hospitals to be left behind, men to be left behind while they retreat. And Porter's saying, no, man, look, we've blown a hole open all the way to Richmond. Turn us loose, man. We got this. And McClellan says, no, not only that, but you abandon your fort, you move your men across the river, redig in, and you defend us while we get away. After a Herculean effort, Porter and his men do this. And the next day, they fight the Battle of Gaines Mill. Jackson finally arrives, but gets lost again, and they send this attack at Gaines Mill, where Porter's men and their cannons just chop the Confederates to mincemeat. So an entire lines of men were blown into nothing, but the Confederates just kept coming. Porter's men are tired and exhausted, and at 7.30 that night, Lee welcomes in John Bell Hood from Texas, and he sends his men in an all-or-nothing charge to take out Porter's lines. And they're able to break through. Porter's men have been fighting for two straight days and two nights. They are forced to retreat. It's the only battle, technically, that, that McClellan loses as Porter's men are forced from the ground. McClellan has absolutely no idea of what's going on because his headquarters were south of the river. And John B. Magruder put his men on a small railroad and was chugging. He, you know, you know, chugged down the railroad, let them off. They'd run through the woods, scream, ho holler, and shout, shoot at McClellan, get back on the railroad, drive down another three, four hundred yards, jump back out. It was the same guy screaming and yelling. But to McClellan, oh my God, he's got to have three or four hundred thousand men. So McClellan telegraphs Washington that he is being assaulted by a superior force all day. Now Porter has wiped out 10 or 11,000 of Lee's men. He's winning, but he's still forced to retreat. As McClellan says, head for deep water, excuse me, and Harrison's Landing. Supplies are burnt. Hospitals are abandoned. But no matter how hard he tries, Robert E. Lee cannot get around in front of McClellan and cut him off. McClellan's attack 
was at a snail's pace. His retreat is lightning. On June 28th, the Battle of Savage Station, Magruder is sent in to slow down McClellan. But he can't. He's got 50,000 guys in front of him. So he asks for help. He says, I can't take them all by myself. Thomas Jackson says, yeah, I'll be there as soon as I finish this bridge over a river called Grapevine Bridge. And then he falls asleep. Magruder attacks anyway, and his men are massacred. But still, McClellan retreats. And Lee wants to trap McClellan in a place called Fair Oaks, or excuse me, White Oak Swamp or Glendale, where it's swampy and, and McClellan won't be able to use his power. He can't spread out and envelop us. But the retreat is so fast, Lee loses them for two days. And at the Battle of Glendale, a Confederate general named Benjamin Huger tries to chop down trees to block McClellan's way. But he's got so much manpower, they just pick him up and throw him out of the way, or their, their two-man lumberjack saw a saw right through them. Huger attacks, and his men are massacred. McClellan's men begin an unauthorized counterattack, but he stops them. A.P. Hill shows up waving a flag, and McClellan panics. Lee is furious. His orders are not being followed, and McClellan is slipping away. And he gets to Harrison's Landing, which is a deep water port where transoceanic cargo ships would offload their cargo that would be taken via train into Richmond. On top of the big hill are several plantation homes that are good for headquarters with this wide, broad, flat floodplain in front of them. McClellan tells Porter and his men that they need to hold the Confederates off one last time. And Porter's like, really, dude? Is there anybody else in this army that can do absolutely anything? McClellan says, take as many of the rest of the men as you think that you will need and hold them off. And Porter's like, heck with that. He has pride in his men. They have fought hard. He sets up another strong defense like he did back at Mechanicsville. Lee wants to attack, The Porter's got something for him. And Lee does attack, and there's miscommunication between um, John B. Magruder, Lowe, Armistead, James Longstreet. Things go awry, and Lee has to change his plan. Some of the guys get the changes, and some of them don't, so there is a traffic jam. And Porter's men start blasting away with their cannons. Riflemen are destroying Confederates, and it is a massacre. D.A. Hill said it wasn't a fight, it was just plain murder. And that with Yankee artillery and Confederate infantry, he could whip any army on the face of the earth. It was a devastating Union victory, except McClellan won't believe it. He believes that his army is barely escaping. Porter and his men have held. Lee's army is shattered. If they counterattack, Richmond is open and the war is over. But McClellan simply can't do it. Lee keeps the army there. He bluffs McClellan into thinking that he has more men. Lincoln comes down and tells McClellan, when you get the men back to Washington, you're fine. The Union Army in seven days has won every battle except Gaines Mill, which I call a draw. But McClellan makes them retreat. Jefferson Davis is so excited, he declares the day the Confederate Thanksgiving Day because Richmond was saved. Lee does not feel like celebrating. People didn't listen to him. So he sends a strong message by firing guys like John B. Magruder and Ben Uger, guys who were instrumental in pulling off this miracle and driving McClellan away. And Lee promotes James Longstreet and Thomas Jackson as his assistants, and the Confederate triumvirate is formed. The three of them are going to work together, pulling off miracle after miracle after miracle. While that is going on in the East, out west, we have another guy known as 
Ulysses Grant, fresh off of his um, campaigns at Forts Henry and Donaldson. All right, people don't really know him. He's this tiny little unknown guy, and he claims the Civil War is going to be a very bloody affair. But nobody really listens to him. But he is a great American story, and he will work well in tandem with his buddy, William Sherman. So, I'm going to skip down here a little bit. We're going to get to this. Um, boom, boom, boom. Grant, after leaving the army, will be working for his little brother in Michigan. When the town raises their militia, Grant is put in charge. And he eventually becomes a general, and he is sent down the river, to the Tennessee River, to capture two forts, Fort Donaldson and Fort Henry. And he does so in early February. At Fort Donaldson, he will capture 12,000 men, along with a buddy of his name, Simon Buckner. Simon Buckner, when Grant left the army in California, gave Grant money to get home. And when Grant rides in after laying siege to these two forts, and Grant, I equate to a bulldozer. He's not flashy, right? His victories aren't great strategic wonders. He's just a slow but steady grinder. So he lays siege to forts Henry and Donaldson, and they surrender. After two Confederate generals, Gideon Pillow and John Floyd, leave. And as Lee rides in, or Lee rides in, Grant rides in, his buddy Simon Buckner is ecstatic. He's like, oh man, good to see you, Sam. What are your terms of surrender? And Grant, with all these news reporters and people looking on, says, my terms are immediate and unconditional surrender. And his buddy Buckner says, Grant, those are the most ungenerous and unchivalrous terms ever. You know, especially since we're friends. And Grant replies, honor among friends is one thing, war is another, and Simon, this is war, you are under arrest. The media hears this, and the Union has their first hero. This guy named Ulysses Grant. The U.S. for U.S. stands for unconditional surrender. But he's fired for a while. He's accused of being a drunk until a news reporter, Elihu Washburn, from Chicago, goes and tells Lincoln, look man, whatever you heard, this guy Grant is the real deal. He did not, he wasn't drunk, he didn't get guys massacred, he knew what he was doing. And the problem is that the Union assumed victory. So guys were trying to climb as high as they could on the ladder of notoriety before the war was over to set themselves up in a cushy job after the war. Many guys were jealous of the fame Grant was getting because they actually won, and they tried to cut him down. Grant will be reinstated, and he will be sent to capture the full Tennessee River and the supply depot at Corinth, Mississippi. So a battle will be fought April 6th and 7th, 1862. Albert Sidney Johnston will be teamed up with PGT Beauregard. Now, Beauregard was demoted after arguing with Jefferson Davis whether to let Thomas Jackson attack Washington after First Bull Run. They got about 40,000 guys between them. Grant will have 50. He'll pick up 20 more from Don Carlos Buell and lose about 9,000 of them. And this battle was fought by the holiday soldiers, guys who, who were trying to get off the farm for a few months or to survive what they called the great test of manhood. This was going to be fun. It was going to be awesome. And we're going to go have a good time. And the Shiloh Church is built upon the banks of the Tennessee River, which has this wide, deep V to it. The only place to offload cargo is this place called Pittsburgh Landing, which is a short route nine miles overland to Corinth. It's a shortcut to the Mississippi River instead of going way north and then coming south again. That is where Grant offloads. But the soldiers on both sides are brand new. 
Many had never on the Union side fired and loaded a weapon before. Confederate generals said that he had never seen a gun fired before Shiloh. Grant has 50,000 men. Coming to link up with him is Don Carlos Buell with 50,000 more. And Sidney Johnston says, look, man, I can't allow them to link up. If I do, I'm due. There will be an unstoppable juggernaut steamrolling down the Mississippi River. So he decides he knows where Grant is, and he's going to hit him hard and drive him into the river before he gets settled. And Grant makes a mistake by not having his men dig in. They were only going to be there for a night. They were going to go down to Corinth. They were going to lay siege to it because that's just what happens. And Grant writes that tonight I am filled with immense peace and quiet. It is my hope that the war will soon be over. This is the last great battle of the West because it appears the other side lacks the will to fight. Also, men on the outpost, Declan and Gabe, look out. Scouts don't do their job. They don't have the discipline. And while in this beautiful idealistic setting, a soldier writes, I'm as happy as a mortal can be. So he puts his men on the march on April 3rd. But now it's his turn for an undisciplined march. And they only go six or seven miles in two days. And the guys were making so much noise. PGT Beauregard is guys, speed, stealth, and surprise. You guys are anything but. Everybody knows we're coming. Maybe we should call this attack off. And Johnson says, Beauregard, I would fight them if they were a freaking million. I don't care. We're attacking, and we're attacking right now. Tonight, we're going to water our horses in the Tennessee River. So here comes Johnson, he's going to fan out in like a trident, or a quadrant, and he's going to shove Grant back towards this deep river right here at Pittsburgh Landing. And between 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning, one of the most vicious firefights ensues. There was dead silence and nothing. Gabe and Declan come running. The Rebs are behind us, the Rebs are behind us, and like flipping a switch, one of the most intense savage firefights in U.S. history begins. Of two Ohio regiments, one is wiped out completely, and the other one turns and runs. Grant's having breakfast, and an aide says, man, it's not that big of a deal. It's guys just clearing the powder out of the guns, or the newbies shooting them. And Grant says, well, then why hasn't it quieted down? So he runs and gets on his horse where he's in the saddle for the next 10 to 14 hours being called equated to Washington at Monmouth or the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo. Wherever the crisis was the most acute, that's where Grant shows up. And the Confederates are advancing on all fronts. Little by little, Grant's forces are being shoved back. And a green soldier is going to do one of two things. He's either going to break and run at the first sign of fighting, or he's going to stick his heels on the ground, and he's going to fight. Well, after the initial chaos, both sides stand away and pound at each other like veterans, like Rocky and Apollo. And it's one guy, General ben Benjamin Prentiss, whose men will occupy an eroded three-foot sunken road. That's going to be the hero of the day. Prentice and his soldiers move over and they hold the center of the Union line while he leaves some men behind in this peach orchard off to the, the side. And he organizes like a Wellington Square of revolving fire and the Confederates hammer and hammer and hammer that area. While behind him, chaotic, cowardly Union soldiers run for the, the river um, with fear in their eyes. The whole army's being destroyed. We've got to um, get out of here. When up front, some of the deadliest fighting in U.S. history would take place. The Confederates begin to call the sunken road the hornet's nest because it's like they kicked over a maddened hornet's nest and they're attacking. They said holding up a bushel basket, they would have it full in minutes. So many bullets were being um, fired out of there. Albert Sidney Johnston has had enough. He leads an attack on it himself. It begins to fail, and he turns around, 
And as he's leading, a shot rings out that he doesn't feel. And he says, man, we're going to have to find a different way to get to the sunken lane. And he sees a wounded um, Union colonel, and he has a surgeon take care of him. And he rides down the hill to meet PGT Beauregard, where he falls off his horse. They're like, General, what's the matter? They don't see any blood. They look for wounds. They pull off his boot. It had filled up with blood as his femoral artery had been severed by that last shot. And Albert Sidney Johnston is dead. So we're going to begin to use this stuff. This is canister shot. These are those golf ball sized things I told you packed in like a coffee can that are going to fly out and like, you know, splinter. They will destroy anything in their path. Grant will write about this day later saying it caused a switch in his mind that it's going to be a war to the um, finish. And the Confederates have massacred the guys in the sunken road. It's getting desperate, and they're firing away at the hornet's nest, but no matter how far they depress their guns, they can't get to Prentice's men. By late in the afternoon, out of ammunition, Prentice, seeing he can do no more, surrenders. And some of the Confederates stop the attack, just like they did early in the day when they were souvenir hunting. They literally go to Ben Prentice, and they ask for autographs. The peach orchard was this disturbing, macabre river of blood with pink, peach pink petals flowing down, following this farm pond to this very day. Grant orders his cannons across the river because there's a traffic jam and a pontoon bridge because people are panicking. You fire your guns. I'll tell you the distance. You just keep on firing. And he sends the Tyler and Lexington down to fire throughout the night. As Don Carlos Buell's 20,000 men begin to show up, cocky, they're the advance guard. And as they walk up the hill to Pittsburgh Landing, where the army had been pushed back to the precipice, they see just desolation, and their bravado and cockiness evaporates. Throughout the night, wounded and dead men were crying for water. And Grant said, mercifully, God answered and give them a nice gentle rain, where he talks with Sherman. Sherman says, yeah, it was the devil's own day today. Grant says, yeah, we're going to lick him tomorrow. But mark my words, William, I'm going to get fired for this. So you need to leave a mark upon the earth. You need to pound the Confederates into the ground. Leave a mark and rub their faces in it, because these people are never going to quit. Part of Grant's army was panicked. Part of it was captured. Part of it was shot up. But Grant says, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. Grant says, God hears the cries of the wounded as, they, as it began to rain. So the next day, Grant and Don Carlos Buell push right back to the edge of the river in this like V-shape, begin a massive counterattack. And they do. And this is where Grant says the war is going um, to change. And the fighting over the next day is just as nasty and brutal as it was the day um, before. The fighting was just as fierce as um, Confederates are fired upon in a bunch of blackberry bushes to drive them out because, as the Union colonel said, they needed a lot of persuading. Step by step, Beauregard falls back and orders a retreat. His men have been fought out, and he can do no more, and he head back to the safety of, of Corinth. When it's all said and done, 20,000 soldiers are going to be casualties, are killed at Shiloh. This is more than all American wars combined up to this point. Revolutionary War, War of 1812, and Mexican War. It equaled... Napoleon's losses at Waterloo, but no one knew there would be at least 20, perhaps 30 of these battles yet to come. And people wanted Grant dead. They can't believe the loss of life. What is this guy? Is he an, an idiot? People begin to say that he's drunk. Mary Todd Lincoln loses a brother on the Confederate side in the battle. Albert Sidney Johnson was the best friend of Jefferson Davis, saying our strongest pillar um, was cracked. But it's the same reporter that will save Grant again. 
He will go back and say, look, man, this guy Grant did everything. Even reports from the defeated Confederates talk about Grant's steadfastness, him and Prentice, during this battle. And Lincoln says, I don't care if he is drunk. He's the one guy that I have that actually fights. And Shiloh wakes everybody up to what the war is going to be like. Grant is the first to realize, realize it. It's a nasty fight to the finish. But 20,000 casualties shocks people. More than all the other wars combined, this was supposed to be fun. This was supposed to be get off the farm or, or out of the factory for, for a couple months. And this is crazy. But Kentucky is joining the Union. The Central Confederacy is cut off. And the last shot at, fought, shot at um, Shiloh um, is fired at Nathan Bedford Forrest, who will pick up and carry the Union soldier who shot at him like a human shield before throwing him down. So it is a beautiful cemetery, Union and Confederate, these nice flowing lines. Right behind here, these trees, you can see the steepness of the hill, goes right down to the Tennessee River. This is right around where Grant's headquarters was at Shiloh. Guys, that's as fast as I can do it. I hope um, that's all you need. If you have any questions, get to me before Friday. I'll see you guys then.